good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of things has already has already been said about this topic, so I can, since we are running out of time, I can uh, shorten my presentation significantly. Let's start by some history. History is important in a lot of things, and this guy, more than 50 years ago, already realized that you should not uh, repair Torkov Donnelly or the cannerisms without using adjuncts. Uh, I was surprised yesterday to hear that still today some surgeons, mostly vascular surgeons, without having experience in cannulation techniques, are still using the cross clamp technique, which is really uh, unbelievable in 2010. But I'm not surprised that they have 22% paraplegia rates in, in these circumstances. Having said that, you're all familiar with uh, the four types uh, described originally by Crawford, and um, in which uh, Hazim Safi has added a, a, a fifth type. You're all aware also about the numbers of the paraplegia rates, which have been reduced substantially over the last decades. The problem is mainly the spinal cord, and the precise mechanism of the spinal cord injury is still unknown today, because it's uh, probably more than one mechanism that plays a role. Uh, drugs have been tested numerously, but uh, I have only one slide to illustrate that uh, none of them have resulted in a significant reduction of the paraplegia rate based on this technique. Temperature monitoring and, and hypothermia has been addressed by Robert and Christian more extensively and more scientifically than this slide uh, illustrate, but uh, you should be aware of the fact that cooling the patient, cooling the spinal cord, cooling the brain will increase the tolerance to ischemia. And just to show you uh, this slide that uh, the, the best protection of course is deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, but this technique is not very often used in torque abdominal repair, except in some circumstances which I'll show you later. Clamping a, a, an aneurysm or the aorta has some uh, impact on, on the brain, on the heart, so it's normal that you should use adjuncts. And initially these were uh, external or internal shunts. These are, at least in my opinion or, or to my knowledge, no, no longer used. So. The, the main uh, topic is keeping the equilibrium between the spinal cord perfusion and, and the, uh, the drainage of the cerebrospinal fluid and the, the hypothermia. You know that by clamping the aorta, the, the pressure below the clamp will decrease and the cerebrospinal fluid pressure will increase. So the, the basic uh, thing is here to drain spinal cord fluid in that amount that you restore the equilibrium between the perfusion and the ischemia. If you lose a lot of blood, which can happen during this, this kind of surgery, it may happen that the blood pressure drops to, to uh, basic levels and that your spinal cord perfusion pressure drops as well. So in order to, to to uh, restore the perfusion of the cord, it really is necessary to drain the spinal fluid uh, because uh, as you're all familiar with the Monroe Kelly principle, for, which is a purely neurosurgical principle, within the brain as well as in the spinal canal, there are three components which are embedded in a, in a, body, in a bony box, namely the, the neural tissue, blood and, and cerebrospinal fluid. If one of these components increases or decreases, it must go similarly with, with an increase or decrease of the other components because the volume must stay constant. So what happens during the procedure of a torque-abdominal repair is that your spinal cord becomes oedemous. If we would be able to 
w to, to measure the weight of the patients at the end of the procedure, I'm sure he, he will increase his weight significantly by, by adding a lot of fluids. And you see it on the tissues, you see it, you see it on the guts if, if the peritoneum is open, and also the spinal tissue will, will become edemous like you see here on this slide. So the only thing that you can do is drain more cerebrospinal fluid to restore the equilibrium. And we, we know something about it, but for example, the venous component of this uh, thing is something of which we know very little, and Christian has addressed this topic a little bit, but I think it is uh, uh, seriously underscored. There was a time that we used double cerebrospinal fluid drainage because we thought the more we drain, the more we can restore this equilibrium. But we have learned from our own mistakes, and we have had at least three intracranial, serious intracranial bleedings due to a tear of the venous structures within the brain, causing uh, quite, quite lethal uh, intracranial hemorrhages. And these, these structures are illustrated here. So we, we still rely on this technique because it's one of the, of the pillars of uh, spinal cord protection. It has some drawbacks, and they are illustrated here. But uh, in, in at least two papers, uh, look at the numbers of the spinal cord uh, or, or the complications related to spinal fluid drainage, it's only 1 to 1.5%. One uh, um, the, the Houston group as well has, has uh, illustrated the same uh, results, 1.5% in total complications related to spinal cord fluid drainage, which is neglect neglectable in, in my eyes. The, the, the main uh, adjunct in, in torical abdominal aortic aneurysm surgery is left heart bypass. If you would ask a surgeon if, if he has only one adjunct and he can choose out of the total number which, he, which one he will choose, probably the most important one is the left heart bypass simply because it increases the flow and the pressure below your distal clamp and in that way it restores the, the uh, perfusion of all the distal organs. This is our actually set up. Uh, we use a, a priming volume of about uh, 700 cc's and, and only 5,000 units of heparin are added to this uh, priming volume. So uh, it, it, we cannot say that we use heparin and, and, and the ACT is continuously monitored every 30 minutes and kept at about 200 seconds or lower. Uh, it's especially the combination of um, the left heart bypass by uh, or with the, the um, cerebrospinal fluid drainage that has enabled us to reduce the spinal cord complications. Left heart bypass has a lot of uh, potential benefits, but also some uh, negative uh, drawbacks. Uh, you can cause rhythm problems by your introduction of the cannula into the left heart. You can have bleeding problems. You can have uh, air entered into the systemic circulation. The, all these things are avoidable. As I said, you, uh, Hazim Safi and ourselves have shown uh, a, a benefit of the combination of left heart bypass and um, uh, spinal fluid drainage. Nowadays, probably 30% of the spinal cord uh, deficits are delayed onset, as Christian has said. It, it's becoming more and more, or let's say the, the, the surgical groups are becoming more and more aware of this problem. And the causes are, again, unclear, but for sure, uh, arterial hypotension is one of the main causes of it, probably in combination with hypoxemia. Uh, very often the patient is uh, extubated a few hours and then um, the oxygen saturation drops, the blood pressure drops, he gets rhythm disturbances and a few hours later he cannot move his legs anymore. So um, if you have it, you can uh, restore it and, and there are numerous case reports that has uh, described the reversal of it by introducing the spinal cord catheters, which is the, the action number one that you should take. But of course you should uh, control the hemoglobin level, you should restore the blood pressure, 
you should give corticosteroids and, uh, and, and other uh, drugs which are written here. Deep hypothermic circulatory arrest has some advantages, but is uh, limited in our center only for distal arch aneurysms or giant aneurysms that uh, preclude a safe entrance into the chest. And of course, if you are unable to ventilate a single right lung, you should uh, go on bypass uh, to, to deal with the problem. This is done from the left groin, venous and arteriously. It has uh, the drawback that you have to heparinize the patient fully, which will cause uh, pulmonary bleeding for sure. Certainly if you manipulate the left lung, which is unavoidable in these, ca in these kind of surgery, it will uh, increase the pump run and um, it, it for sure it will uh, increase the post-operative uh, the, the post-operative respiratory uh, complication rate. So I, I fully agree with uh, Joe Coselli that you should reserve this technique only for uh, special indications like this. So some words about evoke potentials. We have had the pleasure to use it for, for more than 15 years, not only somatosensory evoke potentials on your left, but also motor evoke potentials. Um, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it is helpful in this kind of surgery because it gives false positives and also false negatives. Don't forget that all anesthesiologists anesthesiological volatile gases influence the evoked potential. So you really should uh, conversate with your anesthesiologist uh, and have a, a clear protocol if you use evoked potentials not to be uh, dis disturbed continuously by false uh, results. Um, of course, if you have a drop of the amplitude or a decrease of the latency of the motor evoked potentials, it has the benefit that you can do something. Uh, you, you can increase your distal perfusion pressure. You can reimplant major intercostal arteries if they are open or if they are present. I wonder, and this is a question to Christian, if you have a decrease of evoked potentials after having sequentially excluded a segment of the aneurysm. Based on the collateral network concept, you should not reimplant them. But if your evoked potentials are gone, should you dare not to reimplant it and oversue it? I think you, you, you cannot do it. You, sh you should uh, reimplant them. You have seen this slide. It, it, this is, this is uh, the old concept. Uh, is it wise to look for the Adamkovich? I think it still is, but, but don't waste too much time and, and effort for it. But if you have a big intercostal artery between T8 and L2, it, I think it would be a mistake not to reimplant it. You have heard of it, the, the collateral network and the, the uh, uh, spinal cord uh, direct pressure measurement of which uh, the, the Mount Sinai group and, and Christian has uh, elaborated on it. If you don't believe in, in, in the Adamkovich artery, you should not perform preoperative CT scan or MRI scan to look for the artery because uh, you can forget uh, all this. We still believe in the reimplantation and we reimplant it directly because it takes you only 10 minutes um, if you do this kind of procedures, it will take you more than 10 minutes because you have to do two anastomoses. Two times, two times 10 is 20 minutes. So uh, I think uh, nobody of us who is performing coronary artery bypass surgery will put an eight or six millimeter tube graft on a coronary of, of one and, and a half millimeters. So the patency of these kind of uh, vessels in my eyes is, is unknown and certainly unsure. So let me conclude by saying that the protection of the spinal cord in thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm sur surgery is a multimodality approach. It's not only the hypothermia, 
it's not only the sequential clamping, it's not only the left heart bypass, which is the, the cornerstone of it, it's not only the CSF drainage, and it's not only the intercostal reimplantation, it's the whole of it which is probably most important. Um, one, one slide with regard to TVAR. Of course, you should use CSF drainage because uh, if you cover extensive part of the thoracic aorta and the patient has uh, received a triple A repair previously and the left subclavian artery is covered, it's wise to use CSF drainage in these circumstances. And uh, this is my last slide, which uh, says something about the spinal cord. Thank you. Thank you for staying on time.